There are many excellent diagrams in my copy of Ferdinand de Saussure's course in general linguistics, but my favourite is this one from page 112. The indefinite plane of jumbled ideas, A, and the equally vague plane of sounds, B. This describes both the subject matter and the form of my performance lecture this evening, jumbled ideas and vague sounds, to which I'll add some unhelpful images. So Sewer says that the role of language is to make a link between thought and sound, A and B. But although I'm beginning with Saussure, I'm not interested in the language per se. Rather, I'm interested in the issue of form, which I've figured in my title through the metaphor of states of matter, solids, liquids, gases, and so on. And in what follows, what I want to do is to think about the form that jumbled ideas and vague sounds take as compared to the seeming precision of language. These forms assume a particular significance in cinema, I would argue, in relation to ideas about what constitutes a radical poetics of film. But as you'll see, I want to move between cinema and other modes of representation in order to offer a broader perspective on how the matter of cinema, its sounds and images, are organised. And perhaps more importantly, to consider what might be at stake in different forms of organisation. So join me now as we traverse the indefinite plane of jumbled ideas. Sound fares badly within Caesarian linguistics, constantly stripped from a project that privileges the seemingly stable, abstract, universal paradigm of language over individual, concrete speech acts. Now, as it happens, the starting point for the course in general linguistics is speech. Saussure states, in the lives of individuals and societies, speech is more important than anything else. However, this concern with speech is resolved through the model of language, which is identified by Saussure as a well-defined object in the heterogeneous mass of speech facts. So there's a play here between different forms. The well-defined object, solid, stable, coherent, contained, constrained, knowable, and the heterogeneous mass, undefined, uncontained, incoherent, unknowable. Saussure begins with speech, which has a physical manifestation, sound, and this is then squeezed out by language, which is an idea, an abstraction. As Saussure puts it, language is a form and not a substance. A further distanciation from the sonic takes place when Saussure then most, sorry, nominates writing as the means by which language can be successfully navigated. He states, we generally learn about language only through writing, and apart from their graphic symbols, sounds are only vague notions. In a telling use of imagery that figures chaos in terms of the oceanic, Saussure warns us, whoever consciously deprives himself of the perceptible image of the written word, runs the risk of perceiving only a shapeless an unmanageable mass. Taking away the written form is like depriving a beginning swimmer of his life belt. And so now there's also an element of anxiety at play. Anxiety about this shapeless, unmanageable mass. And anxiety about the oceanic. And anxiety about form and structure charged with the fear of drowning. Central to Saussure's approach to linguistics is the distinction between what is knowable and what is unknowable. And we can map this onto modal distinctions between forms founded on differentiation, individuation and abstraction, and forms that are noisy, chaotic, unruly, unmasterable, and ultimately unknowable. That is, unknowable within this particular system of knowledge. Within the context of a project based on classification, speech becomes a noisy, tumultuous, swirling mass that can only be tamed by language. Quote, as soon as we give language first place amongst the facts of speech, we introduce a natural order into a mass that lends itself to no other classification. And what's particularly telling here is this repeated use of the word mass 
signaling the undifferentiated, the confusing, the confusing, sorry, the unstructured, and most worrying of all, the unmasterable. Located at the heart of Saussurian linguistics is, of course, the figure of difference. In language, there are only differences, says Saussure, expressing the idea that linguistic signs create meaning by convention, and that any individual word is only able to create meaning by being different from other words. Cat, cap, cop, crop, crab, carp, crap. And if you're interested in other lists of similar sounding words, I recommend a book like this, the Collins English Dictionary. Uh, other languages are available. However, the inscription of difference extends beyond the mechanics of signification to suffuse and inform the semiological project as a whole. What cannot be differentiated is rejected as unmanageable and unknowable. So what? Well, Saussurian linguistics is simply one, albeit highly influential, manifestation of what Deleuze and Guattari have termed arborescent thought taking the root system of plants as a way to describe what they call the most classical and well-reflected, oldest and weariest kind of thought. Deleuze and Guattari propose that arborescent thought is founded upon forms of bifurcation, separation and individuation. Binary logic, they say, is the spiritual reality of the root tree. For Deleuze and Guattari, challenging this model of thought is of central importance to any radical philosophical project. Quote, we're tired of trees. We should stop believing in trees, roots and radicals. They've made us suffer too much. All of arborescent thought is founded on them, from biology to linguistics. And if one considers how arboreal modes of thought underpin constructions of otherness, for example, then it's clear what's at stake here. And so in this sense, we might say that form has a political dimension. So within the context of modernism, the inscription of difference takes on radical significance. At the same time, the figure of difference also occupies an important place in art history's take on modernist poetics, as well as the notion that modernism represented a radical break with what came before it. Art history has also made much of the drive towards medium specificity that seems to have informed radical modernist art practice in the first half of the 20th century. This is what many people think of as a typical mountain, a steep-sided rocky peak covered in ice and snow and reaching high into the sky. Such grandeur and beauty bring out man's basic desire to climb and stand higher than everything else and to look down on the world around. This, however, is only one form of mountain. Such factors as structure, latitude and height above sea level create many different types. In the field of early avant-garde film, we witness the pursuit of a specifically cinematic aesthetic and an attempt to develop cinema as an independent art form. For the Soviet filmmakers of the 1920s, who were in the vanguard of experimental filmmaking at that time, the task was to remove cinema from the gravitational pull of other art forms. Thus the Soviet filmmaker Ziga Vertov proclaimed in 1922, we are cleansing Kino Chesvo, this is a a neologism uh, signalling a new kind of cinema invented by Ziga uh, Vertov. We are cleansing Kino Chesvo of foreign matter, of music, 
literature and theatre. We seek our own rhythm, one lifted from nowhere else. The most common type of lowland rainforest in Southeast Asia, the Diptera carp, will often have trees like this in Gunung Mulu, rising to 45 metres before branching begins. They tower over the Penan boy, who is about one and a half metres tall. For many of the vanguard Soviet filmmakers, the essence of cinema, what distinguished it from other art forms, was editing, montage. Hence, Sergei Eisenstein stated that to determine the nature of montage is to solve the specific problem of cinema. Montage was to develop a particular form in Soviet cinema, often conceptualised as a collision or juxtaposition of shots, generating an idea or an, or an affective charge not present in the constituent material. Most mountains in the world are formed as a result of the folding of sedimentary rocks laid down many millions of years ago. Over time, they've been worn away to form ridges and peaks, shown in this view of the Chamonix Egwe in the French Alps. <coughs> For Eisenstein, conflict was the fundamental principle of every artwork and every art form. Quote, For art is always conflict, according to its social mission, according to its nature, according to its methodology. This montage was to occupy a privileged place in what Eisenstein formulated as a dialectic approach to film form, in which the play of difference was seen as fundamentally dynamic and progressive. Here the ground is being prepared using a primitive digging stick. Normally this is a woman's task, and the older lady squatting on the right has been doing this digging until her son-in-law took over in order to appear in the photograph. What we observe in montage is the visible inscription of difference, in which editing reveals, rather than conceals, the cut joining and separating two shots. This marking of suture makes a film's construction evident, and is thus entirely at odds with classical film practice, in which the organisation of the film's material works towards transparency, effacing rather than revealing the edit. Leaning on Brecht, we might say that the classical continuity style of editing supports an illusionistic form of representation, while montage reveals itself, making the construction of the artwork visible, making the construction of the artwork knowable. This is what many people think is a typical desert, an endless sea of tumbling dunes with the wind blowing sand in a constant stream from their peaks. In Algeria and North Africa, these are called ergs. The one pictured is the erg chech. However, different names are used in different regions. For instance, they are called Ramlat in Eastern Arabia, um, parts of Libya, and Akle in Mauritania. In this sense, montage seems to occupy a kind of cinematic moral high ground, a revelatory form that finds its home in films aligned with a revolutionary political project. <coughs> a formal technique that aimed to bring about political enlightenment and political action in films which campaigned for the reconstruction of society. With modern air travel, it is far too easy to suddenly arrive in an entirely new situation and to suffer cultural shock. To minimise this, time should be spent before the expedition, researching local customs, and preparing expedition members to accept an alien culture and to enjoy it. So what about sound? Part of the Soviet response to the introduction of film sound technology in the late 1920s was the application of montage to sound image relations. In a joint statement published in 1928, Eisenstein and his colleagues Savilov Podovkin and Grigory Alexandrov wrote only a contrapuntal use of sound in relation to the visual montage piece will afford a new potentiality of montage development and perfection. The first experimental work with sound must be directed along the line of its distinct non-synchronization with the visual images. And only such an attack will give the necessary palpability with which, which will later lead to the creation of an orchestral counterpoint of visual and aural images. The flat-topped rock mesas and the dramatic rock chimney make this picture look like a scene from a cowboy film. 
This example of the interface between mountain and plain is not, however, in Arizona, but south of Beshar in Algeria. Note the outwash from the hills forming a discernible Piedmont and the scrub vegetation clinging to the water runoff channels at the base of the hills. The 1928 joint statement on sound has cast a long shadow over discussions of sound image relations in cinema. Entering the general critical vocabulary as the somewhat simplified notion of counterpoint, the figure of vertical montage, that is sound image montage, has occupied a privileged position, both within both filmmaking and film criticism, as the widely held view that the soundtrack should not simply echo or illustrate the image. Consequently, the concept of redundancy is often called upon in discussions of film sound to denigrate certain forms of audio-visual synchronization, such as so-called Mickey Mousing, uh, in which sound is perceived to slavishly follow or duplicate the image. Thus, a commonly accepted principle of good filmmaking is that sound should maintain some form of independence from the image rather than be determined by it. In some instances, non-agricultural indigenous people still live in the forest environment, hunting and gathering from the wildlife around them. Many tribes in the Amazonian basin are being faced with extinction as their forest home is destroyed. Similarly, this Pinan in Borneo, using a blowpipe to obtain food for his family, will have to alter his mode of living if he is to integrate and survive. Within radical film practice, forms of audio-visual counterpoint are particularly valued because of their straightforward opposition to dominant naturalistic modes of cinematic representation, but also because non-synchronous sound has the potential to reveal rather than conceal filmic construction. This revelatory dynamic occupies an important place in radical film practice and criticism, which have long been at pains to disentangle the sonic from the visual. Here, the use of non-synchronous sound is positioned as a self-reflexive, deconstructive, anti-illusionist strategy, empowering cinema's ordinarily passive viewer. In unhooking sound from image, Non-synchronous sound lays bare the matter of cinema, at the same time puncturing the naturalistic illusion created by the synchronisation of sound and image, described by one critic as the sound film's fundamental lie. For scenery on a Wagnerian scale, the peaks of the Hogar take some beating. This view is from the Hermitage at Asa Krem. So far we've looked at different types of desert landform, and we're now going to examine the effects of erosion by water and wind on those landforms. Thus, political discourse relating to sound image relations has been articulated primarily around the figures of naturalism and a resistant other, <coughs> constructing on the one hand an illusionistic, manipulative cinema of deceit, and on the other a radical, anti-illusionistic and virtuous form of counter-cinema. But despite the wealth of alternatives to classical sound image relations proposed by animation, documentary and avant-garde filmmaking, this single notion of a non-synchronous, contrapuntal and dialectical use of sound has nevertheless been privileged within established discourse on radical audiovisual poetics. <laughs>
big problems of the established discourse on radical poetics in cinema is that certain modes of film practice can't be understood within this tradition. Consequently, some modes of film practice have been neglected, forgotten, ignored or dismissed as having no obvious political potential. To choose just one example, in the field of visual music, filmmakers have sought to fuse sound and image in the creation of synesthetic effects. The visual music tradition has certainly been marginalised in histories of the modernist avant-garde and completely overlooked in studies on the radical poetics of cinema. Here, the, in the inscription of difference that characterises forms such as montage and contrapuntal sound is entirely displaced, replaced instead by figures of mutual interaction, interdependence and dissolution. Montage is replaced by folding. The sound is folded into image, an image into sound. These termites are less than two millimetres long. The Baroque refers not to an essence, but rather to an operative function, to a trait. Folding certainly gets a bad press with some of the key figures in modernist poetics. This huge undulating sand sheet is the Mureire region of central Mauritania, sometimes appropriately called the Mauritanian Empty Quarter. It does not invent things. There are all kinds of folds coming from the East, Greek, Roman, Romanesque, Gothic, classical folds. In relation to the discourse around medium specificity, Ziga Vertov wrote, we protest against that mix of the arts, which many call synthesis. The shape of this rock formation in the Erg Chech has been sculpted by aeolian or wind-blown sand. Yet the Baroque trait twists and turns its folds, pushing them to infinity, fold over fold, one upon the other. The mixture of bad colours, even those ideally selected from the spectrum, produces not white, but mud. As has this horned and fanged animal-like rock also in the Erg Chech. The Baroque fold and fills all the way to infinity. Similarly, Brecht stated, so long as the arts are supposed to be fused together, the various elements will all be equally degraded. The process of fusion extends to the spectator, who gets thrown into the melting pot too and becomes a passive, suffering part of the total work of art. Here, plastic sheeting and tough polythene bags are used to catch enough rainwater for drinking. First, the Baroque differentiates its folds in two ways, by moving along two infinities. Witchcraft of this sort must, of course, be fought against. The corridors between the ridges are usually firm, except where, as you can see here, road lines of cross dunes make it difficult for vehicles to pass. As if infinity were composed of two stages or floors, whatever is intended to produce hypnosis is likely to induce sordid intoxication or creates fog and has to be given up. Although they, this may look like another salt lake, it is in fact simply a mirage, the pleats of matter and the folds of the soul. Words, music and setting must become independent of one another. Within the study of cinema, no one has been able to do much with visual music at a theoretical level, and certainly not within a political context. Many invertebrates such as spiders, centipedes and millipedes, ants and earthworms live in the soil or litter and can be easily be collected using pit traps. Below, matter is amassed according to a first type of fold. Studies of filmmakers who have explored synesthetic forms within the visual music tradition tend to concentrate on technology, technique, or on matters of authorship. 
Here you see local boys helping scientists to sort out the contents of these traps, collected at intervals up the mountain, and then organised according to a second time. Outside these frames of reference, the only other consistent discourses offered for synesthetic cinema are the cosmic and the psychedelic, as proposed by Jean Youngblood in Expanded Cinema, a book that opens with the line, Jean Youngblood became a passenger on spaceship Earth on May the 30th, 1942. This picture shows the huge igneous intrusions at Adra Tun, to the west of Taman Rasset and the Hogar Mountains of Algeria. To the extent its part constitutes organs that are differently folded and more or less developed. As well as relocation to outer space, the synesthetic is also displaced in time. Witness, for example, this scene from Ib Melchior's tedious piece of sci-fi crud the Time Travellers from 1964. Colour is the keyboard, the eyes are the hammers, the soul is the piano with many strings. Here Oscar Fischinger's Lumigraph describe how Fischinger as a colour play instrument is used to suggest some sort of futuristic, synesthetic art form. An art that will only find its true place and time in the year 2071. The size of the outcrop is clearly shown by the Range Rover in the bottom right of the picture. Light warm red has a certain similarity to medium yellow, alike in texture and appeal, and gives a feeling of strength, vigour, determination, triumph. Above, the soul sings to the glory of God inasmuch as it follows its own folds. Witchcraft indeed. The original smooth form of the rock can be seen in the top left of the picture. In music, it is the sound of trumpets, strong, harsh and ringing, but without succeeding in entirely developing them. The futural and cosmic dynamics of visual music are perhaps indicators of its unknowability within particular systems of thought. Once it was all like this, but the repeated heating and cooling of the rock has caused exfoliation, the cracking and peeling of the outer layers. A cold light red contains a very distinct bodily or material element, but it is always pure like the fresh beauty of the face of a young girl, since this communication stretches out indefinitely. What synesthetic forms create is a radical sublation of sound and image, a hemorrhaging of the inside into the outside, in which each modality becomes permeable to the point of dissolution. Fragments of the rock have fallen and have been weathered. By the wind and sand to form the boulders at the bottom of the outcrop. The singing notes of the violin express this exactly in music. A labyrinth is said etymologically to be multiple because it contains many folds. But such forms lie beyond the reach of modes of understanding founded on the inscription of difference, on differentiation and individuation, beyond the reach of what Deleuze and Guattari term arborescent thought. This type of forest is often dense and difficult to penetrate. Orange is like a man convinced of his own powers. The multiple is not only what has many parts, but also what is folded in many ways. Visual music falls outside the frames of reference determined by histories of art that understand modernism primarily in terms of structural differentiation. This housewife from the Bawani Mountains of Papua New Guinea is extracting sago juice from another species of palm. It is worn by old women and in China is a sign of mourning. A labyrinth corresponds exactly to each level and as a consequence visual music seems to bear no relation to any of the strands of political modernism that have been so influential in determining what is thought to properly constitute the radical poetics of sound image relations in cinema. As she kneads the pit in this bark trough, the milky juice is filtered through fibrous leaf sheaths before it is heated over an open fire. In music, it is an English horn, or the deep notes of wood instruments, the continuous labyrinth in matter and its parts, a labyrinth of freedom in the soul and its predicates. But hold on a minute.
Does that mean I'm championing fog and mud and witchcraft? Am I saying that folding is better than montage? Am I saying that folding is more radical than montage? Am I saying that folding is more political potential than montage? Well, I'm not sure that I am. First of all, I don't think that any particular form is inherently or essentially radical. I start out this talk by trying to explore the connection between form and knowability. And it may seem that I'm on the side of the unknowable, the oceanic, the folded, the synesthetic. And that's true to a certain extent, particularly because of the ways in which these figures have been marginalised by established discourse around politics and art. But I was very much struck by something Barbara Hepworth either said or wrote about a work of the 1930s. I saw it on a TV documentary, and if I remember it correctly, she said what was called for at that time were forms that were clearly defined and precise. Radical sculptural forms that challenged the confusion of that era, which is to say, of course, form is political. Uh, and by way of some sort of conclusion, I'm going to quote the art historian Susan Stamford Friedman, who says, the aesthetic is always imbricated in the political, the historical, and vice versa. And here's the sort of punchline, not a single set of formalist characteristics, but rather a formal per se. Thank you.